Hi, great to see you all here. Um, and we've got an amazing um, panel tonight. I'm really excited. Um, and the format's going to be um, about 40 minutes of us talking, um, and then we're going to open it up to the floor, so you're going to have a chance for um, some Q&A time. Um, so I'm briefly going to introduce the panel. I say briefly because if I was to sit here and do their full kind of um, back catalogues, it would take some time. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Tom Piper. Um, so Tom was involved in student theatre in Cambridge in the mid-1980s and designed over 30 plays then, working with friends like Sam Mendes and touring to Edinburgh and around Northern Europe. Uh, he began a postgrad in theatre design at the Slade, but left for Paris uh, before the course ended to work on Peter Brook's production of The Tempest in 1990. Um, returning from Paris, he went on to work at the Orange Tree Soho Theatre and with Michael Boyd at the Tron in Glasgow. He worked extensively with Dominic Hill and regular co um, collaborators um, have included Abigail Morris, Sam West, Connell Morrison, Tim Supple, Polly Teal, uh, Chris Renshaw, uh, Sam Mendes and Erica Wyman. He's Associate Designer at the RSC from 2004 to 2014 and mentored the RSC uh, Assistant Designer Scheme. Uh, the collaboration with Paul Cummins and the Tower of London on blood swept lands and seas of red in 2014 was seen by over 5 million people. Um, Ez Devlin um, has been working for 20 years. Um, <laughs> Canvas during this period has expanded from plays at the Bush Theatre to architectural projects in New York, Louis Vuitton shows in Paris, installation projects in Peckham and the London and Rio Olympic ceremonies. She's currently working on a large-scale maze installation um, to be shown at Art Basel, Miami in December. Um, her concert tours have included um, The Weekend, ABBA, Pharrell, as well as plays opening next year at the Royal Court, the Littleton and Donmar Theatres. And John uh, trained at the Motley Theatre Design Course. He designed the opening ceremony for the 2012 Paralympic Games in London. As an associate artist of the RSC, he has designed numerous productions, including Hamlet, King Lear, The Winter's Tale, and the entire 2012 What Country Friends is This Season. Um, Theatres include The James Place, The National Theatre and A World Tour, Bat Out of Hell, The West End in the US, The Grinning Man, Bristol Old Vic, and the winner of Best Design UK Theatre Awards, Kursk at the Young Vic and Sydney, Ghost Stories, The West End, Toronto and Moscow, Lord of the Flies, The Regent's Park <laughs> Open Air Theatre, <laughs> Mamets, National Theatre of Wales, winner of Best Design UK Theatre Awards and the Wales Theatre Awards. Um, opera and Dance includes The Nutcracker, uh, also, so, also co-director of Norwegian uh, National Ballet, Hansel and Gretel, The Royal Opera House, Scribblings, Castaways, uh, with Rambart, uh, Blood Wedding at the Finnish <laughs> National Theatre, <laughs> and lest we forget, the English National Ballet, uh, the Knot Garden, um, and Joanna. Um, <laughs> Joanna is an award-winning designer based in London. Uh, she received the What's On Stage Best Set Designer Award for her site-specific design of the Railway Children, uh, which went on to win the Olivier Award for Best Entertainment in 2011. Uh, having trained at the Royal Shakespeare Company, she's developed a unique path through the live arts and theatre industry, um, and her work specialises in creating unique and extraordinary experiences, inhabiting spaces from the intimate to the epic. Joanna's diverse output includes commissions by RSC, Old Vic, Channel 4 Arts, Royal Historical Palaces, Covent Garden, European Olympics and UNICEF. Um, her recent works include productions at the Young Vic, Royal Court, Manchester Royal Exchange, and the Abbey Theatre Dublin. So, just join me in uh, welcoming our. <laughs> so you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you'll be pleased to hear that's most of my talking done, um, <laughs> and you guys are going to be uh, having the floor. Um, so, I just wanted to start by asking you all what. Um, what do you know now that you wish you had known then? <laughs> what one thing, because I'm sure there's lots, but what one thing do you wish you had known when you were, when you were starting out? Who wants to kick us off? I think, um, I mean, I'd love to understand the people who are here. Are, just, can I, do you mind if I just ask? No, I'm uh, fascinated. Uh, how many of you, if you put your hands up, are 
uh, uh, training or at the beginning of your career as theatre designers or as set designers. So that's that, that's about half probably, isn't it? Yeah. So that question is going to be, you know, <laughs> yeah, all of us. Um, so perhaps that's, you know, yeah, 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 what you're getting at there, which is um, perhaps the, the most important thing I think maybe everyone would would say is that the people one works with, uh, the collaborators that um, that one's going to find, and it's it's going to be a bit like life that you either bump into, you know, the, the people who are going to make uh, an important effect on how you work, and and the ones that you might gradually feel that they're not. Um, so I think that's probably the most important thing that um, have to have in mind as you're working. So it's quite easy, I think, to fall into collaborations and sort of carry on with them and then find that maybe they're not um, the most positive thing or, or you know, maybe one has learned everything one can learn. Um, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, in the, in the biogs that we just read out that, you know, I, I, I noted on your bio that it's very much about those collaborations. Mm. Who is it that one's had those conversations with? I think for me that, yeah, the great thing about uh, collaborators is that actually it enables you to create shortcuts. And I think one of the things that's very, and a common language and, and shared way of expression. And one of the things that I see so often with people starting out in the profession is, is an incredible amount of work. You know, you're, I'm incredibly impressed by the dedication that so many people show. Uh, but very often it's sort of on your own. You haven't got anyone to spark off mm -hmm. Uh, and you spend mm. hours going down things. Whereas if you work with somebody like Michael Boyd, he destroys your model within half, <laughs> within five minutes of, of a design meeting. Things are ripped apart. It becomes free. It becomes creative. You learn very rapidly to let go of ideas and allow uh, your design to change and develop. And, and of course, when you're younger, you feel so precious about your design that you've put so much energy into making that model chair. And when it goes out the window, it's, it's a trauma. It's a disaster. <laughs> but actually, just let it go. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah I think so. And I, I think I'd, I'd agree in that um, a sense in letting it go. It's having trust in the people you collaborate with. So if you have that shared language, you have a, a let's say, a visual linguistic kind of language that you've got with them, it allows you to sort of make those changes without such a trauma. But I'd also say that... Um, in that is like there is an, an inherent need to be quite brave and I think if someone told me 10 years ago actually uh, as an artist you kind of need to present uh, uh, a true idea um, and you need to kind of um, allow it to develop and that there isn't actually a right way to answer a design question for a, for a, for a joke I think Quite often I thought, oh, right, okay, we're going to be doing, uh, I don't know, let's say we look at Macbeth, there's a correct way to do this. And I think it's quite often that you are, you see a lot of older designers and you work, I prim primarily worked with a lot of older directors when I graduated. And actually it's about being brave enough to kind of go as an artist, this is my idea, I'm putting it out there and I'm hoping and allowing you to kind of accept it. But also knowing that like those ideas, as you said, will develop. And basically what my answer is, is um, that there's no right answer and that you have to kind of you have to kind of accept the fluidity of it and that's what makes those collaborations that's what makes those dialogues so fulfilling because you grow in it together so yeah don't spend sort of hours sort of fixating on an idea because that has to be fluid that has to adapt with both sort of the concept of the director what comes out of the rehearsal room um, so I would tell myself to sort of not look for a correct answer but investigate kind of your your ideas um, in a really open dialogue. I think I'd second that. I think it's the person. I think it's remembering yeah. that you are the. It's what we were talking about a minute ago, actually, downstairs. Yeah. Is that it's it you are it's you as an artist that are the one that's different to everybody else in this room, mm. and and you can't compete in that way. No one can compete in that way, and it's it's just an aesthetic choice that might you might have been chosen to do that particular show, um, or that contact that you might have had. Um, but to be brave and to kind of enjoy that rather than to get, as you're saying, I think, kind of worried that you're not doing the thing that's in the book. Because uh, often you see people kind of channeling those same ideas that we've seen. You read the textbooks and they're all in those books somewhere along the line. And you see people essentially kind of regurgitating those mm -hmm. ideas, which is fine, which is great in many ways. But it's what's, what makes you individual that's the thing that is worth kind of remembering and, and really championing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we do get frightened. I mean, I get frightened of like now. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I think we, I think we do, and especially when you 
talking about a bigger project like as in designing outside of the theatre when you're working when you're just like approaching something like the Olympics or the Paralympics for the first time and you've never worked outside of a black box essentially theatre and suddenly to be you know confronted with a 90,000 seater stadium with no roof you're suddenly going what do I do but you can't look it up in a textbook and and, and so it's just you have to go back to those mo moments you had in that fringe theatre you're like, well, what do I do? I've never, I don't even know what a fringe theatre is. I've never been in a fringe theatre. I've seen a, a you know, two-tiered circle structured proscenium arch. I've never been in this black box. So how do I approach this? And I think it's remembering those, that, that kind of brave, that kind of being brave about the, your approach to, to what we do. And how, kind of following off on that, how did looking outside of conventional, you know, theatre, um, whether it's going to the theatre or looking in the textbooks, um, how did looking outside and beyond theatre help you all to establish your own, um, kind of differentiate your own visual languages as designers? Um, what were some of the kind of source points for you or, or how did you negotiate that? Because there's something really powerful, isn't there, about visual storytelling, about, you know, we're talking about the linguistics and, and all of the other um, kind of elements, but... Um, essentially the you know the power of the image of the frame um, what were some of your points that you pulled from um, Tom that 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 helped you to grow in your visual language uh, I suppose in my actually unlike the, the panel here I haven't actually done that much outside of theatre spaces I just happened to fall into a project that did happen to be outside a big castle um, and uh, <laughs> And, and I, I sort of took with it exactly that, basically the approach that I was in some kind of giant fringe theatre uh, in an organisation that didn't know the rules of what should be done or how it should be done. And I think that's one of the interesting challenges is that when you go to a theatre space, you, you, know, you work with the structure of that theatre company, there'll be production managers, there'll be a whole kind of thing set up that you in theory fit into suddenly when you're confronted in some of these outdoor or event things that infrastructure no longer exists and you're sort of you come across like say in the tower of london there were people who um they didn't actually have a way of contracting artists to work with them i was contracted like a scaffolder because that's the only thing they knew was <laughs> scaffolding companies come and god they have to do really terrifying drawings and I was going to sort of stand up and they go no we need the drawings like the scaffolders do with all of the regulations and all that sort of stuff so uh, yeah. dealing with that dealing with English heritage people going you're not allowed to go anywhere near this you can't can't do that and and most I hit quite a few points where I almost gave up because hitting the bureaucracy of dealing with an organization that wasn't really used to or prepared to work with me um, was almost too much so some of the things that became the iconic things of that installation, like the poppies that came out the window, I almost didn't do because the scaffolding issue was so big. And eventually we got the person who worked for English Heritage to come with us on a trip to Plymouth to go to TR2, which is a theatre co uh, construction company. Uh, and we kind of bullied her on the, the you know, <laughs> got her on our, our side on that three hour train trip down there, showed her the stuff, got her excited by what we were making and came back and she was on now on our side and relented. But if we hadn't done that, it probably would have just been a field of red poppies. <laughs> and as your visual language is something that seems to be constantly sort of evolving and, and, and developing in not only its kind of spheres of, of where you're making, but the... Um, infrastructure of how how you're creating the spaces that you do how for you how what sort of sources do you pull on in developing your visual language and in particular the communication of the visual storytelling whether it's the visual storytelling of, um, of um, uh, Kanye West or of um, a more kind of formal play actually in terms of what I do what pieces I make that they're not terribly dissimilar. Um, it's it's you know it, it you know there's quite a few where I'm trying to sort of follow a, a train of thought uh, through various media. So it might be, um, for example, um, in this theatre actually in the Donmar, um, we we made a piece of work with a, a wonderful director called Lindsay Turner, and it was um, a play by Brian Friel and um, called Faith Healer, and we made a box of rain. And at the time, I was making a box of rain in the O2 arena, and it was touring for Adele. And we used the same, actually, we used the same technique. 
and it was the same thing. And um, I'm very un um, kind of troubled by using the same thing again and again and again. I will never have enough of you know that box array, and I'll keep <laughs> trying to scratch away to see what else it can bring in a different situation. Um, and I've, I've, I've got a, a maze thing that I keep trying to do. And I, I found the first model I tried to make of a maze before I really had many assistants. And I wasn't very good at drawing or, or model making, but I was trying to make this maze in 2005. And it's still sort of churning around my studio now. We're still trying to make that maze in different ways. Um, so I think scratching away at the same itch and, and finding they might be like little motifs, like little musical motifs, little lyrics that you keep coming back to in your practice. And there's no, um, I think, need to worry about the fact that you are kind of allowing them to resurface in different conversations with different collaborators in very different environments. And as Tom has highlighted, you know, the experience of trying to build a piece of scenery in a theatre like this is, is very supported. Whereas if you try and do it um, even at the V&A, you know, mm. it'll be a very different thing. There won't be an infrastructure, or if you try and do it in a stadium, it'll be a different infrastructure, a very different language. And I personally find that really invigorating, that one's constantly kind of wrong-footed and saying the wrong thing, getting the language wrong and being slightly wrong, because um, you're never slightly, you're never quite settled then. And it's always when I feel settled, I start to be disappointed in my own work a bit. And how about you guys? What's... Um... <coughs> Well, I, I mean, I think um, I'd say the. I, I think Es is right in so much that you bring your own kind of, you bring your own visual dialogue into whatever job you do, and it's. I think we all kind of share those sort of visual itches that we sort of we we're trying to work out and resolve through through these different sort of projects, but I think. Um, I mean, I started out primarily in um, what was terms of site-specific or immersive theatre um, when I came out of um, college, probably, you know, at the stage that you guys were at. And I think it would be sort of a miss not to kind of uh, look at it and interpret it in a kind of, um, there's kind of like a, I'd say there's kind of like political social thing to it as well, mm. which I think is really interesting. And um, not that those issues aren't sort of addressed within sort of conventional theatre spaces, but I often found that a lot of performances that I was going to, um, they were kind of very much embedded within a, a theatre discipline. Tom spoke about the sort of the regimented way that a show happens, and that's because it works. And when you go into another space that hasn't got the, that infrastructure behind it, there is a sort of, um, there's a sort of, exciting fluidity that kind of surrounds making work in those spaces and I think because I was seeing so many performances in amazing institutions um, but the discipline there felt like it was sort of um, at that stage of my career maybe slightly unachievable or I couldn't access or I didn't know how to traverse that kind of world so there was a sort of a freedom in the immediacy of occupying a space mm. um, and whether you go there through I trained in sculpture first so my avenue in was kind of understanding space um, how that um, can reinterpret performance how the actually if you put a performance in a space it helps you to reevaluate the your your sort of understanding of that space I was really fascinated by that because it felt like a currency I could exchange in so I think a lot of the performers writers directors that I was associating with didn't share the sort of values of this discipline and they didn't sort of they didn't necessarily want to or had no means to sort of have that structure to support them so it became a little bit um, more about a creating a democratic space maybe mm. um, one that um, allowed for a slightly more uh, maybe marginalised voice or, or narratives that weren't quite being told. So I think my avenue was a sort of, uh, in, a, in a sense, sort of trying to resist that and trying to reappropriate um, making work um, that spoke of what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I went into it in a kind of, I don't know, conceptual way. And I brought all the, the training, I brought all the training that I'd, I'd had um, from Tom, which like, Tom was the first sort of guy to take me on and like um, with the RSC. So I brought all that sort of understanding, but tried to sort of find a, a flexible, more permeable space that would allow me to play with how audiences interpreted Journey um, mm. and how I, I think how they had agency, like I felt I had agency. So we played, um, I played a lot more with that as my design concept, like what my audience saw, what I allowed them to sort of venture into, how they cognitively made sense of meaning. Um, so that's what 
took me into that and kind of inspired mm. the beginnings for me, I think. Um, so as well as aesthetic and being about place and form, it was as much about sort of making work and having um, agency and sort of the ability to sort of create as an artist, I think. Yeah. And you talked about coming from a kind of sculpture um, background, yeah. which rings on my bells because that's what I did at Goldsmiths. Um, um, and John, you um, came from a music, a kind of a yeah, music background. Yeah. And, and how did that um, help to kind of infuse the practice that you've got now? Just thinking about the kind of backgrounds that some of the guys in the room might have and, and coming at theatre design, perhaps not from a, maybe a traditional um, journey or, or, or approach. Mm, I think I think I think about this on the way over actually. I was thinking it's a li- it was a little bit twofold because I think there's a I think I spent a lot of time as a kid sitting in churches because I was singing the choir at school so that paid for my schooling and looking at these looking at figures within uh, this piece of architecture that's massive that's like sky high and that these massive fan vaulting pillars that go to fan vaulting and take you up into the sky and bring you down again and and being bored senseless in these places, <laughs> but listening to this incredible soaring music, which I, I did find amazing. Um, it, it, it made me think a lot about architecture and a lot about space from a very early age without realising it. And the, there's the proportion of a figure, a, a yeah. human being in that space, to what they were trying to do was take you up to God or whatever they saw as God. And back, and, and But also, they do a very clever thing in those pieces of architecture. They also present... They, they provide a human scale that allows it, so there's kind of two things going on at the same time. There's the kind of the, the epic spiritual in their head, in, and then there's the kind of human level that we all exist on. Um, and I drew on that a lot when I was designing in the stadium for the first time, because I, I mean, I was confronted with just a big building that I didn't really understand, but it was so big. and. The other important thing about what I was doing was I was working, we were devising it. I was really lucky in that there was no script, there was nothing. We started from day one, and Bradley and Jenny, who I was working with, Jenny from Grey Eye and Bradley Hennings from Greenwich and Dublin Festival, were, we were all started as true collaborators, and they were really encouraging and, and welcomed me into that fold. And we all just started, and we created the story together, which is incredibly lucky. But And the story was about placing people with disability in the middle of that stadium and giving and telling their story and if, and when you're trying to promote and focus a figure that's uh, you know might not be particularly tall but anyone in that stadium looks tiny when you sit 90,000 seats away they're all specs so the whole thing was <coughs> trying to focus those that's that spotlight without light often on on those figures and, and make them focal, make them big, make them grand, and and, and create that scale so that you could really tell that personal story mm. for those people. And I think that's kind of that was a semi kind of musical influence. Mm. Um, so interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it makes yeah. me think about the Kanye West cubes and the the vulnerability of that scale, mm. you know, of the human scale. And so often um, you know, thinking back to past gigs I've been to in the days um, of, you know, the projection of the of the performer and making them huge, whether that's, you know, but, yeah, Adele and, 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 and that um, vulnerability of, of scale um, and how, how actually, you know, is there a shift to us wanting to, as audiences, experience the kind of humanity of, but, yeah. the hum, you know, the yeah. human... But I was thinking about that in terms of Ez's progress tour. Was it progress? I'd try, I'm not going to take that from but you, you you create, you. there was a big sorry, <laughs> I should be now uh, there's, there's, a, there's a big um, there was a big figure in the stadium in one of your shows a long time ago um, and I was thinking about that because I think we've all done it to, to a certain extent and Gormley does it to a certain extent mm-hmm. we, we, had, we kind of personify we kind of like it becomes essentially the personification of us we, everyone is trying to um, is seeing themselves in that figure so effectively You've got two you, in those kind of performances. You've got twofold thing going on. You've got essentially the human scale, the real performer, but in that world, you had a bigger, you had a bigger figure that essentially is still us. But it's the kind of I want to be this. I want to be this big. Yeah. And and, and I did the same thing in, with Alice and Lapper to a certain extent at the end of our Paralympics um, festival. And I'm sure you've done 
the same thing. I think it's drawn on many times. Yeah, and I think you've got something in that. I think that what's unique about sort of not being within a fixed frame is that you get to play with scale. And when you play with scale, you get to highlight sort of the insignificant of, you know, of a person existing in a space, but also you get to multiply that and you get sort of, you know, it's quite often that you, you know, have mass choreography and you achieve something in those plays of scale, which I think it helps audience really place themselves as an implicit part of that performance because they get to sort of reframe <coughs> their own experience within within that sort of context rather than being sort of implicitly part of an audience who are watching sort of passively. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really sort of wonderful experience to sort of invite people into. And there's lots of talks about um, immersive work. It's been, become very popular. And I think a lot of people sort of misunderstand that and think that it's the notion of um, sort of keeping someone in an environment that sort of somehow is... Um, within your design um, is somehow sort of um, playing on lots of experiences, senses, you know, which is wonderful. But I think actually what immersive is about is about allowing uh, the audience to have a contingency. There's an ambiguity of like who they are in that space because it's it's huge or small and they're focusing on different places and it allows them to re format their own presence in it and it allows them to frame it rather than praise and frame over it, mm. which I think allows them just sort of exist within it, have that agency, which is why it seemed to be sort of like such a dynamic kind mm. of part of theatre to work mm. in for me. It seems to really the reaction of audiences are, are, are quite sort of, um, are quite sort of unique in that sense, I think. Mm. Oh, it's two really interesting things. I mean, it's such interesting stuff that you're both saying, and I think congregation is one thing, isn't it? Because mm. any theatre is, is a congregation. I think there is this gorgeous sense of... Um, I mean, certainly when you're designing, I, I find, because I, quite a lot of my work now is, is pop concerts, and the, the first ingredient of the pop concert is the audience's great anticipation of seeing the pop star. And so the first kind of job of the set designer in that, or in any kind of show influencer of that, is to just not fuck it up. <laughs> because that's, the, you, you know, <laughs> or, rule number one, don't fuck it yeah. up. That actually, that's mainly what I get paid to not do, is not fuck it up. As long as I don't fuck it up, job done. <laughs> because, because they're cute, they want to come, they want to see the pop star, and, you know, then, you know, next steps are delivering the pop star in interesting ways and allowing communication and all that. But, um, so yeah, congregation. And then I think this word immersive is very interesting because actually... Um, going to see Albion um, the other night, which I just thought was a phenomenal, if you can get in, a phenomenal <coughs> piece of theatre at the Almeida. Um, utterly immersive. You're sitting in your normal seat, you're just looking. At when a piece of theatre works, it's immersive, mm. as you say, because when it's working, then the set design is happening in your head, in the head of everyone, and that beautiful mm. feeling when you're sitting next to everybody and feeling the penny drop in all that little ripple around you in the audience. So... Immersive means that, I think. Mm -hmm. Immersive doesn't mean sort of wandering through it. Immersive just means it, it worked and you didn't fuck it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I suppose I had a, an interesting experience with the poppy thing, which was you weren't really sure who your audience were mm -hmm. and who your performers mm -hmm. were. And the original concept for the piece was very much, it was just going to be an art installation and they would, it would be viewed in a, quite a passive way. But because, as in all theatre things, it nearly fucked up, um, <laughs> we... I've got my test <laughs> Well, it, no, it was meant to happen in three weeks. It was all meant to be planted in three weeks. Uh, but logistically, I think by the middle of June, you realised that getting 888,246 poppies uh, <laughs> on site and planted in that little of time just was not going to happen. So at that point, going back to this thing about authorities being a bit difficult, people were going, well, we should just cancel the whole project. It's going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, at that point, again, on another train journey, we did a, we did a thing of, uh, let's come up with a way that this thing could happen over time. So mm -hmm. it became, in mid-June, it suddenly became an event that was going to happen over three months, having been going to be three weeks. And it was then going to have to be ramped up and staffed by volunteers who were going to have to come from somewhere. So recruiting these people, initially they were quite, you know, groups of 20. But they, the weird thing was that those people arrived as sort of, you know, 
volunteer act activists to do a job, uh, but they started to become the performers and they started yeah. to become the creators of the work. So mm -hmm. I'd marked out, you know, put this height there, that height there, you know, with spray paint and string and everything. And within the first day, people started going, oh, I'm going to put a tall one over here, and, they, and those are all clumped densely over there. And they started creating their own organic pattern based around mine. Every now and then I'd go around and push one down or take one out <laughs> and move it around. Because, but fundamentally, you, going back to the let it go thing, kind of suddenly realized, actually, they are creating this. They now own this work of art. We had 21,000 people in the end who volunteered to do it. Um, and then, the people who started to congregate and watch became the viewers and suddenly they were yeah. applauding the people down below them and it became this thing that we we hadn't expected to be a performance it became performative and meanwhile the people down on the ground were sharing stories about their own families or some people from the forces had you know their own horrific injuries or losses so it became a kind of place of contemplation and mourning and sharing down there and then that atmosphere kind of transferred up there and you've got this incredible dynamic going on between the kind of crowds watching and the people uh, doing their thing there. So it became immersive on, on many different levels in a way that I could never have planned for. Um, and it was purely by chance that we ended up in this situation and that developed in, in that way. It makes me think about, um, there's, um, I work at the Tate and there's a, a gallery there called Participant and Performer. Um, and it makes me think about a lot of the work that's in that space and this idea of the kind of spectacle and the spectator um, and the shift in between those two arenas and the and what you were saying um, John about the the kind of ritual or the ceremony and this collective moment of remembrance um, this collective moment of um, of stillness or of silence or of uh, conversation that was kind of happening amongst people as they as they were kind of as they were there and it, it makes me think about you know this idea of making work outside of the theatre or beyond the kind of maybe traditional stage walls as a site of potential for engaging in this in, in this in this space where um, you know if if people don't have access to a you know whether it's um, being, you know, um, assisting um, at the RC or, or kind of in a theatre programme, actually, what what do you guys see as the potential today or kind of going forward for occupying public realm spaces in a more informal way for whether it be iteratively testing ideas or, um, you know, developing new work for young designers that, m that might not have access to, to stage space? Are there, how do you kind of feel about that? 180 um, strand, isn't it? Yeah, 180 yeah. strand. Um, I feel there's a bit of a danger at the moment of the sort of the wrong use of immersive where you get an endless queue of people going to see like the rain thing in the curve at the Barbican where it becomes the kind of thing you have to tick off and yes. do as part of your cultural experience or I'm going to queue for three hours to go down a slide in the Tate. That it's me. a swing at the moment. It was a swing, now it's a swing. Really um, but, and I do, I do think that one of our, you know, we've all done it, it's about being rule breakers and challenging in what is increasingly becoming a very controlled public environment yeah. to actually go in something and in fact, my greatest pleasure was to trip up the head of health and safety at the Tower of London on some degrees. <laughs> and he's a C centre assistant right the way around the moat with a ball of pink string to replace the green because it wasn't safe. But that, that, <laughs> and I, 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 throughout my kind of career, I've always tried to, other unwittingly, trying to sort of break the rules of, and, yeah. and, and fight against this thing. And I think for young people, you know finding a space and just doing a pop-up thing or a happening or whatever, that's what we should be doing um, to kind of enliven our public spaces rather than let them kind of be you know, over-curated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think curation is an interesting point you bring up because um, the idea of sort of taking a selfie in a, a in a Rachel White Reed kind of <laughs> installation, which uh, you know we've all we've all been there because it's incredible. But um, you know there is this sort of there seems to be this sort of drive to kind of like um, claim your own presence in this piece of art. And there, or you I could call it self-portraiture. 
Yeah, I, I think so. And I think actually it's fascinating. And I think that that is what has really led to this sort of um, sort of acceptance and boom of kind of work or investment in work that isn't, that sort of a, a allows for that kind of dialogue from the people who are, who, who are sort of engaging with it. Um, and in theatre, I think, I think it's, it's it's a difficult thing because there are different sort of companies looking at different modes of sort of creating work like that immersive site specific promenade um, and they all have different avenues and sort of techniques but I think um, the idea of sort of becoming a, a protagonist within your own sort of story feed or actually within you know having some sort of input into the outcome of a people a piece of work that contingency I think is really exciting because I think a lot of people a lot of audiences a lot of spectators are questioning where they're standing as a spectator like what you know I, I, do they do I need to be in a photograph to to sort of make to qualify that or do I need to have spoken to an actor who's offered me something and shown me a door through to another route for me to feel like I sort of had a unique experience and I think you know there is an interesting question here about audience and ownership mm. um, and I think Tom's right it's very I think it's very important that in theatre we use a you know I'd say the you know the company I work with we employ sort of uh, we work a lot in verbatim so we work with sort of um, uh, people's stories and we're very sort of careful as to how we kind of like theatricalize that but also like I think that there is also a discipline we have to be very careful as designers that we don't fall into sort of maybe a more facile kind of. Uh, uh, sort of spectacular kind of like experience and that actually there is meaning that can be sort of very specific and important and 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 kind of self-affirming meaning that mm. I think that this work harnesses mm. um, which I stand by I think it's mm. really exciting and as just to come back to that um, um, point about um, kind of self-portraiture um, mm. obviously the Theatre is, is, is generally known as a place, a bit like a gallery where you turn your phone off um, and, you know, you, some places you can take pictures and some you can't. Um, whereas the arena or the, the site of ceremony or kind of um, memorial um, is a site where we're, you know, freely able to kind of document and capture visually through the frame or the lens of, of, of the camera and it kind of lives on in, in, multiple, in multiple ways. What's your experience like of, of creating work you know, um, in the theatre where the ex you know the experience is is um, manicured in so much as it's you know an audience kind of coming through it, um, every night um, that are static as opposed to a kind of a very live, agile, energised audience in you know arenas and um, in in a kind of musical sense that are perhaps less predictable or I tell um, you what I just want to answer the first part of your question the photograph just yeah. talk about photograph for a minute because there's so many people who say I love your work I say, you've never ever seen any of my work mm -hmm. you've seen a photograph you yeah. know is mm -hmm. or is the photograph the work you know mm -hmm. what what what's left where is it so I think the photographs a really interesting thing to talk about and I mm -hmm. think something that I think you wouldn't know unless you worked as a theatre designer or certainly if you unless you work in a theatre is that the act of making theatre is impossibly fugitive to photograph. You can barely photograph it because there's literally, and this is just a technical point, there's a moment when you can take a photograph of a theatre production and it's in the dress rehearsal, isn't it? Because the economics of the theatre are such that um, it's such a crazy thing to do to spend money on stuff and have so few people paying not too much money to see it. It's an economic you know, miracle that even happens. Um, and that any, you know, so, so, so therefore, that's the reason why you can't photograph it. It's like an endangered species, because what happens is, the only time you can photograph it is in the dress rehearsal, because the minute the thing is even remotely fit to be viewed by an audience, then people have to start paying for tickets, and it's called a preview, and we have to keep working through it, and the thing might not be quite ready, the set might not be quite built. But the reason why they're called previews instead of continued rehearsals is because of the money. Because you've got to get the money in quickly because there's so little money to be had. So, so therefore, if you didn't get your camera out, which means basically be an arsehole if you're a set designer. <laughs> if you weren't the arsehole who got their camera out where everyone else is sitting there working, then how did you photograph the work? In this very theatre, I remember, I was trying to take pictures of the Faith Healer. And I was going around, I knew I wanted the picture. <laughs> so I was sitting with my nice camera, I was sitting like that, 
And Lindsay, our lovely director, was going, can you shut up? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I was like, I said, but if I don't take this photograph, there will not be this photograph. There'll be one little funny press call thing. Some lovely photographer will come and he doesn't know the piece. So that's a really important point. Whereas obviously the other work, you know, popcorn, so you can photograph till the cows come home and everyone will photograph it. Mm. Um, and, th and therefore people don't know a lot of the work that's been made. A lot of the exquisite, amazing work that people in this room have made I've seen it, but I haven't seen it in any photographs, you know. Mm. But what I thought you were going to go on to say was <laughs> the, <laughs> the idea of creating an image. I think, I think there's a danger, and I think we're led into it with this, in, in, in an Instagram generation. And I think probably Lingry Pride is also slightly responsible for also sometimes pushing this too far, which I'm also responsible for. Um, which is pushing, an Im pushing a one image, pushing an idea that becomes that image of a play. So we judge, we go and we judge that design on that image. So we go, oh wow, it looks amazing. But, you go, but you, what you forget is that it's like a piece of music. Theatre has an A and a B. And we move through it and it never stops. And, and it's a flow through that. And we... we as designers, I think, have to design that transformation of an idea, of a psychology, of a whatever, of a concept through from A to B. You can't just present an image because that image will, won't, won't work after five minutes or ten minutes or might work at, mm. at ten minutes before the end. But up until that point, you're kind of questioning that image. And I think, I think it's really important that we... I always see a, a play as a piece of music. I see it as an A and a B. And I think there's a... There's a, you're going through lots of different strains to get to that place, and the tessitura is here. It's it's so wide at places in places that you you really need to try and think about how that what that tension is that you're holding in your design. Yes. Um, and I think sometimes it doesn't happen. I have to say, and I think sometimes we're confronted with br brilliant images, and we all go, "Oh my God, it looks amazing!" But you forget, you kind of go, "But actually." thinking about it, it looked amazing when thinking about the play I photographed that image in my head but it didn't mean anything to the play because the play I'm now still thinking about but all I've got in my head is just an image one image and also we don't, you know, I feel that we're sculptors over time and, we are, and in we a are. sense to drive cool. yeah. Yeah. say at the RSC where we moved from a proscenium into a thrust main space was all about creating a more immersive space, still within a theatre space, but it's about the actors, the audience sharing the same space, and therefore as a designer, you are having to think as a sculptor in three dimensions. No one has the same view, and it must be exactly the same in stadium time, is massive. Um, and, and it's an event that's happening over time, and the moments that might look like beautiful photographs, are they, it's a kind of Results of the collaboration of you know the actor, the performer, the lighting designer, the soundscape that was there at that moment that you can't hear in the photograph. All of those coming together to create that moment that then dissolves, and you're on to the next one. And that's the kind of that's the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah I think I think it's sort of sorry. I think it's really sort of as you were saying, it's really easy to be sort of seduced by those images, and they're sort of what we all sort of have seen, and we're sort of like you know it's how we, it's how we sketch, it's how we work, but but equally you, you described I find it really interesting that you described it as a piece of music. I often feel like a play for me feels like a like a journey. I almost sort of like map a kind of progression through it. The person gets to a certain point of catharsis, crisis, and it's those moments that. I sort of like punctuate a design or a space or, or a particular audience member in a particular place within that time. So I think that actually um, it, it's about sort of sculpting the space, but also it's about sort of sculpting the duration. And that's what, I mean, sort of bringing it back to sort of site work, that's about sort of, you know, creating spaces and journeys where um, the position of your audience and, and what they're experiencing has to match the narrative that you're sort of creating. So How do you feel about, I mean, I find it's quite intriguing when you have something like a punch drunk show. Hmm. And the experience that people have is so radically different. You know, you come out of it and people go, did you see the bit where everyone got naked? You go, no, <laughs> I missed that. And did you have a one-to-one? No, I, did. I was too busy looking at the bars of water with the clothes floating in and <laughs> all the actors going around. And, and I'm not, you know, one bit of me found that a fantastic experience, but in the end, partly also because we were all masked, I didn't get a communal experience. Mm, yeah. And for me, I want that communal experience and my fellow to feed off my fellow audience people and kind of know that we've 
sort of shared the same experience. Yeah. 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 On that yeah. musical note, <laughs> <laughs> um, I know that the audience are itching to commune and to, um, to ask questions. Um, I just want to wrap up that with a... Um, I think there's a really beautiful, um, complex empathy, actually, in the process of design, whether it's theatre design or product design or um, graphic design. There's a, there's a, there's a kind of empathising into whether it be the box that you, you know, create or, or into the text or into the experience, um, kind of both visually um, and also, um, you know, acoustically and in so many complex ways in, in what you do. Um, but thank you so much. I could keep, I've, I mean, I haven't, I'm not going to lie, I haven't scratched the surface. Of the <laughs> um, but I'd really love to open it up to the floor and to give you guys the chance to, um, to ask some questions. So, um, at the back. Hello, hi. Um, just a question about... Do you want to stand up? Yeah. Is that okay? Thanks. Just a question about collaboration. Uh, I come from a background of lighting design and I was really lucky as to have worked with you many years ago where I think you explored materials that were light friendly and that taught me as a lighting designer to come in at quite an early stage and make that quite integrated. Um, how important is that to you and what is it that we can do for the next generation of designers to come in and work more closely together if you think it's important? I think it's absolutely crucial and I said this morning I wrote an email to a producer saying um, regardless of the availability I need the lighting designer to come in at a much earlier stage for me it's absolutely vital I think storytelling um, creating spaces um, and sort of installations um, you, uh, you need to you need to harness all the tools you've got there and having a sympathetic having that dialogue with the lighting designer who understands the beat or the moment where the cognitive penny drops and having that um, uh, sort of uh, uh, let's say that painted with, with um, and also sort of like underscored with light I think is absolutely like vital um, and I think it's changing I'm getting a lot more sort of uh, a lot more sort of designers lighting designers who want to be part of the collaborative process they're also part of the like conceptual process as well which I love um, so I would only encourage people to sort of describing light as well as a really sort of abstract concept and there are sort of you know there are styles and approaches but actually to have a real dialogue when someone describes something and you've seen that work and you've already had an exchange where you know what they're describing helps you to build spaces that work and tell stories that sort of like you know that, that have have meaning and um, so I would say as much as sort of trying to court directors, like talk to lighting designers, talk about their experiences, because I really, really promote that as much as possible. I think it's, it's all collaborators. I don't think it's just lighting designers. I think it's I the video designer, it's, it's the music, it's the musician that's involved in the room. I was talking to a composer having exactly the same um, question from him this morning. And, and we were talking about getting into the room earlier together, because I think you're creating a world together and I think it, it, I have to say the other thing is it's a very lonely experience being a designer sometimes and you're on, on your own you're sitting in the studio banging your head against the wall maybe there's someone watching you banging your head against the wall um, but you're paying to watch bang against the head yeah. um, and um, I'm going really um, and I, I think I think it's really useful sometimes to, get, to have the opportunity to ring, to ring someone up get somebody into the studio work with them you know, ask their questions, uh, just get an, a response that is not just a kind of direct, directorial response, which is obviously just leading you down a particular idea. When you're, you're trying to open that up and to, to all parties involved, because when you get into a tech, it, it can also be a quite a lonely environment because you're back, in, you're back into making that design work. But there's a lot of other people in the room trying to also make everything else work, and you've mm -hmm. got to come together. You've got to create that thing, that world together, whether it's sound, music, um, lighting, video. It's all got to work together to work to the machine. Any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Do you find that when you're working outside of traditional theatre design, in an installation or a concert, that you are? thinking maybe more about the image and creating something that's immediately striking and recognisable to a wider audience rather than something that builds over time um, or has a different spark? 
I, I, I think, I don't think so specifically. I think, you know, the, the application of everything that was said in my response to talking about taking photos is absolutely true, of course, for anything. They're all time-based. They all unfold over time. This is obvious. Um, and everything is unfolding like a piece of music. One has to score it and one has to work out an arc of it. Um, and I think a, a pop concert has its own arc in a way. You know, there's the excitement of arriving there's the excitement of the pop star. You know, there's a kind of arc to it that one has to um, accommodate. Um, I, I do think what is the case, though, is that when there's a theatre, there's an awful lot of stuff hidden. Like You were talking about the infrastructure, but there's the physical infrastructure that's concealed in a roof. So you can magically make a very beautiful, uh, pure statement and gesture in a, in a theatre. When you're in a stadium, you've got to build the theatre. And there's a lot of... Um, conservative sort of habits around how to build structures in stadia, which involve big black trusts and huge great big speakers. And um, that's why every pop concert, a lot of pop concerts look the same, because they have that. Um, so if you can somehow get under the skin of that, like in, in Bregenz, an opera festival, where you can build all the speakers into a sculpture, then suddenly that looks very different. Um, so yeah, in, in that sense, one's always carving the edge of something against a negative space. <coughs> And just thinking about that edge, what would um, be one thing, maybe from each of you, that you would say is um, like a universal truth of theatre design that's applicable to outside of, you know, that's, that's translatable and transferable to other, other arenas? <laughs> <laughs> can just be one, then we'll, we'll kind of we'll go on. Uh, truth to materials, I suppose. One of the things I often don't like about theatre spaces is that you are, there's an art, an element of artifice, you know, that might be to do with, you know, that you, you can't, uh, the material you want to use is too heavy for the change round. So if somebody comes up with a lighter weight version, then someone has to paint it to make it look like <coughs> rusted metal, for example. Whereas I think when you're in the, the kind of harsh world of an outdoor experience or everything, everything has to be what it is. And you have to sort of like, so for me, when doing the poppy sculptures, it was all about creating the rusty metal or, or doing the things around it. So it was trying to be true to that, really. Okay. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> you what's, what's like a, um, a universal truth um, that about theatre design that is kind of translatable, transferable outside of... He's got more time to think about it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 your answer about, about materials and the illusion of materials. I just think that's such an interesting area because I've been working with some architects at the moment. I'm actually recruiting my studio and I've had a whole bunch of really fascinating architects come in my studio. And this truth material thing, to be honest, I didn't really understand. I never really mm -hmm. understood it. But then they told me about what a fake I was and how everything was fake. And <laughs> <laughs> now I understand. If only I'd been trained as an architect, I would have known that. Um, but um, uh, a universal truth that one has learned as a set designer that's useful beyond, uh, I, do, I do think it comes back to um, time. I, th I think mm -hmm. what you were saying, I think we'd all agree that one is, you're designing something that doesn't exist anymore now. It, it, yeah. it, it was a moment of time. Um, yes, that I, I do think another object is the photograph, and it's another thing, and it's an interesting thing. But the time is what you're making, um, and the, the time will be only remembered by the people who were there. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd agree to an extent. It's about the it's about the presence of the of the performer and the and the viewer and that exchange. I think that is sort of purely unique to the form that we do, whether it's inside a theatre, whether it's in a rural palace or, you know, or in, a, or in a stadium in the Middle East, you know, I think that someone is watching it and through watching, through through taking in an aesthetic, through taking something visual, they're drawing a meaning from it. Um, and I think sort of sculpting how that meaning is interpreted and understood, that's, that's, the, that's, the, universal, that's the universal key to telling any story. I mean, I think it's a collective experience. I think it, you are there as, as an audience watching something happening and unfolding mm. in front of you. And I think you, you can't forget that audience wherever you are. And, and you, the whole point is focusing and, and making that story happen in front of you. And I think, going back to your question a little bit, is I think often it is good to create a totem at, in, at some point in that ceremony to, or ritual that in, in, in kind of... In, 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 has in, in it, invests in it, all that kind of 
energy and belief that that audience have and to give them something that is, whether that's an altar, whether that's a cross or whatever that icon might be, um, a whacking great pig, um, yeah. it, 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 it becomes essentially that, that, that totem for that audience. And I think that is quite important. And, that's, and sometimes that is a little bit different to, to yeah. what we do in theatre. And I think what's specifically about that totem is that, you know, if you go and see a piece of art in the gallery, it remains there. If you look at a picture on Instagram and you go back three weeks later, mm. it, it's still yeah. there. But actually what you walk out of from a, a durational piece of work is a memory and an understanding. So those totemic mm. kind of moments mm. are those moments that people hold within them. That's the sort of, that's purely unique to performance, you know, that and everyone has their own interpretation of it. So however you're doing that, in whatever mode and genre you're working in, that's the principle that you have to sort of be aware of when with for your audience I think yeah um, what's your opinion of live screenings of plays and cinemas oh, I love them <laughs> I would say that Yerma oh because yeah, I couldn't get a ticket oh, I thought it was brilliant I love it because the camera doesn't move around too much it's not too choppy it's no like busy old film directors it's just mm. <laughs> I love it moments. Yeah, I think for, for me, I probably got into theatre by watching uh, the mysteries, the national mysteries, and Nicholas Nickleby, are the RSC thing on video, you know. And I was in a in Oxford, nowhere near these major centres of theatre. So, and I've worked with directors, people, you know, some of them like Michael Boyd, who are very resistant to things being filmed. And one of my big regrets is that I did the whole huge history cycle. And all there is is some terrible back of the stall sort of shot, you know, with bad sound. And, and a bit of me just goes, I just wish that but it goes back to that ephemeral thing. On one level, that will remain forever for people, an event that happened, and, and there's no proper memory of it. So there is this sort of interesting tension about how much you allow things to remain in the memory. But I think in terms of access, it's wonderful to have these things available to people and people can get to see them you know, all around the country as well. Mm -hmm. And to, there's not enough money for touring, you know, and a lot of great actors don't want to go touring. So actually giving that access to, to, to the general public is really important. And everyone has a great seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Um, I was wondering, given the fact that you're all like uh, theatre makers for a long time, um, as a, when you just graduated, uh, you're sort of in this fight. I'm coming from the Netherlands, and I notice now that it's kind of hard to recognize like what work to take on and what work not to take on. Especially because um, where I come from, loads of the work you get offered is all like free, for free or basically nothing. Um, so sometimes I'm wondering, like, it's experience, and you know, what do you have to say yes to everything to start your career or? Uh, or shouldn't you? And how do you recognize, like, um, yeah, obviously it's just a feeling that you have yourself as well, but is that sort of like an advice, or is it just to follow your pen in a good so way, yes. or is it just like... <laughs> Such a good question. Well, John should answer yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> John says just say yes. I suppose, I, yeah, as everyone, everyone, everyone as will tell me that it's the wrong thing to say, probably, but no, I, I would say, say yes. I would just say I yes. I agree, say yeah. yes. yes. If you can afford to, as long free, as you've got if someone paying rent. Live on baked beans, just do it. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 I, lived in a, I lived on a floor of a fringe theatre called the Arcola, which wasn't the Arcola you know. Um, for three years, I was squatting in the, what became the, 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 um, the dressing room. It's not when you were working. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I lived off both means, but I, I and I learned because and to, by doing these shows with Mehmet, essentially, like for fifty quid, what can you find in a skip? I did about ten yeah. shows in about a year, just like that. <laughs> you know, and I learned loads. I learned loads of bad things as well, but, <laughs> but actually, I, I owe my career to it. I think. Yeah. What were you going to say, Jen? I think it, it definitely uh, like opens sort of you know avenues, and you'll never know where it leads. And I think to sort of like the, the more sort of like the more you can kind of sort of like expand into that world, you know, that's not going to do you any wrong. But I also think that you're at a stage where you've got enough time to really pursue what to because lots of people are going to offer you work to do for free. So pursue the work that you want to do for free that's as well because you're lucky because the Arcola and Mehmet I mean, that's a fantastic yeah. space to start. So yeah. if you're in that position, don't wait 
like go and find it. I left university because I was bored and I went and found the people I wanted to work with. And I think that was the best decision that I made. So, you know, yes, you're not passive in this situation. Yes, say yes, but like say yes to the right people. Don't do weddings. <laughs> <laughs> We had, we had a thing on the, the event on, on Saturday was some, where we were doing some advice surgeries. And some were, it, was, it was cash, kudos, or connections, I think. You know, and that actually, you probably won't get cash, you will, but you probably will get connections, and you might get kudos if it's the, the right kind of production. But, I mean, I do, you know, we've all, you know, I, I put my career down to having a van. And I was able, I was the person who was able to go to Brick Lane, buy the props, and then drive them to the theatre and do the fit up and then yeah. do the get yeah, out. Right. It's yeah. great, you know. Yeah, that, I had a Makita so I could put things together. Yeah. <laughs> that skill sort of like enabled the beginning of my career. Yeah. But I think there is a, and it's a, it's a really difficult tension because I think we, we're not careful is that you can glorify the uh, artist in a garret thing. And there are lots of problems with in our profession about underpay and people working you know, all hours that God sends for no money uh, and we have to find a balance you know between actually yes commit and do things but please be you know careful of your mental health your physical health and all of these things around uh, the desire to, to follow your career uh, and I think it goes back to collaborators to make sure that you work with people who treat you with respect and don't abuse you uh, either in exploiting your work or in any other way. Uh, and and that I think that's the most important thing to start. And if you get into a relationship which you don't like or you're in a you feeling abuse, just get out of it. Just leave. You know, they mm. don't feel that you're, you're owed the, to give this sort of, you know, this fully your work for nothing. Yeah, great. I totally agree. What's, we got uh, time for one more question. One more. Okay. What's your best advice for the transitioning from the sort of early stages where you're driving things around in a van to <laughs> the sort of later stages of your career? How do you <coughs> not get overwhelmed with all the big challenges of working on sort of big stadium projects and bigger productions? Well, I think if you if you've got to the point where you're already you know at th that version that was just described here of you know engaging relationships with collaborators, driving the bits around, then it will carry on from there. There isn't really a kind of, if you don't find it overwhelming to be picking stuff out of the dustbin to do really low, that's kind of in some ways um, your baptism of fine. If you've got through that, you probably um, will continue to go uh, from strength to strength in a way, unless, unless it isn't the right realm for you, because that's the other thing. It might, it might be the right place, but it might not. You know, that's the other thing you'll discover. And, and, and largely that'll be about whether, whether you like going to the theatre. So it really, so many people came through my studio this week and I said, have you actually ever been? <laughs> have you ever been to the theatre? You know, it's, some people love the idea of being a set designer, but they don't go so much. So I do think, you know, know, know whether you actually even like it as well. Yeah, and don't give up, I think don't give up the thing that makes you interested in what you're doing. So don't give up picking something out of a bin, mm. like myself, <laughs> which Becca over there will t tell you about. You know, without, if, you, if, you, if it's actually key to your process, just keep on doing it. Don't suddenly go, oh, I'm now going to work in a white studio. Because if I worked in a clean white studio, my work would be really shit. <laughs> because, because, uh, because I don't work like that. I can't just transform the way I work. I have a process, and it has been my process, and I've developed it over years and years and years so, and in exactly the same way. And it's only when I get scared and I try to do it differently that it goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but, and it's really, and I find it, and it, it's kind of like what we're talking about, Tom, doing with this, with this you know, environment that we're all talking in now, is we all, as designers, we're constantly trying to learn and do new things. And I think we're all learning off you guys, and you shouldn't forget that, because we're all here to learn off you That's as well point. as you to learn mm -hmm. off us. Mm -hmm. And I think, there's, I think one of the challenges is you might get a great relationship with a director and then what I see happen very often is this director is picked up as being the next sliced bread. And they are, are offered to, and the theatre gets them, and they go, but I think we need to give you a bit more support in the design side. And suddenly that young director gets given a more experienced designer, and you're left behind. Mm. And, and it, it does happen quite often, and I think it's something that, you, you know, hopefully, if you have a good collaborative relation with that person and, and you can encourage that director to kind of say, we can go together to this, if we can create great work together, 
you don't need to work with Tom Piper, work with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think if you've developed those skills at this stage and they've worked, then those skills, um, they only multiply into a bigger venue, they only multiply into a bigger sort of budget and actually what stays the same is the conversations you have and the ideas that you bring in. So it's just about sort of allowing yourself. You probably yourself. all have imposter syndrome as well. You, know, you all kind of think, oh. I couldn't possibly, why am I doing this? I haven't, I haven't got the skills to do it. But <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a, definitely a thing to sort of say. Like every, most jobs, you get that kind of. I still get that thing. Like I, you know, I did my first stadium show, and I was still rooting around in a big um, storage yeah. container trying to find some stuff yeah. to tie to a camel because it. Was, <laughs> you know, so there's, you know, it happens, and you do it, and you get through it, and it's great because it's the same skill. It's just like you've, you've got a camel. Camel. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's great. So I think we're going to have to um, wrap up. I just wanted to finish with two um, quotes um, that, um, that, that I quite like. Um, so um, Lewis Weaver says about performance making and social change, if you can imagine it, you can make it, and if you can make it, you can change it. Uh, Peter Brook says, you change things not by preaching about it, but by doing it. Get on your horse. So, from camels to horses. Um, thanks so much for being here, and um, just join me in thanking our panel.